The June 13th, 2017 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Elkoffer? Here. Mr. Ancello? Here. Mr. Baroth? Here. Ms. Boyce? Here. Mr. Brew? Here. Mrs. Brown? Here. Dr. Carbone? Here. Mrs. Conley? Here. President Danielli? Here. Mr. Delahanty? Here. Mrs. DeFlorio? Mrs. Draw? Here. Mr. Felder? Mr. Flagler Mitchell? Mr. Harris, Ms. Harris? Mr. Hebert? Mr. Howland? Ms. Cayley? Mr. Lightfoot? Mr. Marionetti? Mr. Michike? Mr. Morelli? Mr. Moyo? Here. Mr. Rocco? Here. Mr. Shepard? Here. Ms. Taylor? Here. Mr. Turp? Here. Mr. Wilcox? Here. Mr. Zale? Please stay seated. I'd like to introduce Pastor Sammy Drayton Sr. of the Hope Divine Church of God who has been invited this evening by legislator James Shepard. Pastor? God bless you. God is a, a good God. We don't ask that you just rise uh, as I prepare to voice a prayer unto the Almighty God. If you're able to stand, if you're not able to stand, that's all right. Let us look to the Almighty God. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your kindness. But most of all, O oh God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Knowing, O oh God, that in the midst of all that we deal with, you're still a dependable God. You are indeed the giver of all good gifts, and we thank you for all your blessings. Bless these, your public servants, men and women, who are serving in various capacities for the betterment of our community, our city, and our county. Bless this legislative meeting with your divine intelligence, that right thoughts will prevail, right decisions will be made, and precious Father, Allow your Holy Spirit to touch and be a guiding light to this evening to all the participants of this meeting. Lord, impart your supreme wisdom upon the activities of this meeting so that when it's all said and done, your wisdom will have a positive effect on all concerned. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There you go. As we ask uh, Legislator Justin Wilcox to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Legislator Wilcox. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you. Oh, there you go. We're going to ask the legislators to please stand. And without objection, we'll take agenda item number 17 out of the regular agenda order. Agenda item number 17 is moved by legislator Marionetti and seconded by legislator Cayley. Will the, will the clerk please read the resolution in memoriam for former city of Rochester Deputy Mayor Leonard Radon. of the Monroe County Legislature on the recent passing of former City of Rochester Deputy Mayor Leonard Reedon. Be it resolved that the Monroe County Legislature hereby expresses its deep sympathy at the recent passing of former City of Rochester Deputy Mayor Leonard Reedon. And whereas Leonard passed away May 9, 2017 at age 65 after a courageous battle with cancer and whereas Leonard was a lifelong resident of Rochester, New York. 
He began his career as a photographic product engineer for Eastman Kodak. During his 28-year tenure at Eastman Kodak, he served as president of Kodak's subsidiary, Qualex. He also served as president of Customer Equipment Service Division and Kodak Regional Vice President in the Midwest. After leaving Kodak, Reedon worked for Paychex Inc. In his time there, he rose to the position of Area Vice President and Vice President for the Western Region. And whereas, after retiring in 2011, Leonard became involved in the public sector. As Deputy Mayor, Leonard was in charge of day-to-day -day operations with oversight of most every city department. He was well respected by city leaders and served under two administrations. His work for the City of Rochester helped fulfill his desire to be involved with something significant. And whereas, Leonard is survived by his wife Denise, children Jason and Jennifer, and their families. And whereas, Leonard will be remembered for his dynamic leadership, intellect, and kind nature. He will be greatly missed by all who knew him. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the legislature is hereby requested to forward a copy of this resolution to the bereaved family. This resolution was adopted unanimously with each legislator rising in his or her place for a moment of silence. Thank you. You may now be seated. Legislators, your copy of the Journal of Day 5, May 9, 2017 is available on your tablet and without exception the journal stands approved as submitted. There is a hearing loop in place tonight to assist those who are hearing impaired. Anyone requiring assistance should inquire in the clerk's office. If you have a cellular phone, pager, or other electronic devices in your possession, I would request that you make it inaudible for the duration of the meeting. Thank you for your cooperation. Legislators, the referrals submitted to the legislature for the next committee cycle are available on your tablet as well as online for the public. Please join me this evening in congratulating our Majority Leader, Brian Marionetti, on his nuptials last month and on his recent return from his honeymoon. Congratulations, Legislator Marionetti. <laughs> I'd also like to take this moment to congratulate legislator Mike Rocco, uh, who became a first-time grandfather. His daughter gave birth to a baby boy, Harrison, last month. Congratulations, legislator. And I've also been informed that uh, Teresa Bertolone has uh, just completed her degree. So congratulations to you on that great accomplishment. And last but not least, in a true bipartisan uh, uh, effort, we have legislators Tracy DeFlorio, legislator Debbie Draw, and legislator Cindy Cayley, all who participated in the Breast Cancer Coalition of Rochester Walk held on Mother's Day in the Genesee Valley Park. Uh, together with many, many others, they raised over $113,000, which was donated to the Rochester Breast Cancer Coalition. So great cause, and uh, thank you for your participation. <laughs> At this time, and without objection, uh, we will take agenda item number one out of the regular agenda order. Madam Clerk. Item number one, referral 17-0153. This will be moved by Legislator Marionetti and seconded by Legislator Cayley. This is for adoption. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. This evening, and this resolution that we just passed, uh, we are honored to have Joanne Van Zant, her family, in the audience this evening, and I would ask that they join us up here at the public podium, along with County Executive Cheryl Donolfo, Majority Leader Brian Marionetti, and Minority Leader Cindy Cayley. If you would all join me here at the podium, I would appreciate it. Good. Good to see you. Good. You guys can come right around the
This evening, I'd like to thank County Executive and members of the legislature for supporting me in the dedication of these legislative chambers in honor of the late Joanne Van Zant, who passed away just over a month ago. I'd also like to thank the member of Joanne's, members of Joanne's family for joining us today. Ted Van Zant, there's Ted right there, a good friend, her husband of 66 years, her daughter Connie, who traveled all the way from Virginia. Thank you for making the trip. Uh, along with Tad and his family, Tad, there you go, and wife Carrie and son Theron, right? Theron's a f future superstar, so he's up here joining us tonight. Uh, Joanne and Ted's children, Tim and Carol, could not make it, but they certainly expressed how proud and grateful they are that we are honoring their mother tonight. I've received overwhelming support from my fellow members in the legislature to dedicate these chambers to Joanne. She was a trailblazer for the participation of women in government and worked tirelessly to ensure that women would, could achieve anything they met, set their mind to. And she certainly had a positive impact on her daughters who began to pursue their careers of their own around the same time Joanne became the first and only female president of these, this Monroe County Legislature. Her daughters Carol and Connie shared with me that Joanne looked back on her time in the legislature as some of the best years of her life while serving in the legislature. She was the dedicated mother of four children as well as an active community member. She was involved with the Susan B. Anthony House, the Girl Scouts of Genesee Valley, Tri-Delta, Landmark Society of Western New York, and other organizations that are part of what makes our community such a great place to live. I'm fortunate to have had a, a good friendship with Joanne. She was uh, one of my first mentors uh, when I was a Boy Scout in my teens. Uh, Joanne helped me with my Eagle Project and uh, she was instrumental in kind of showing me the ropes of politics and, and frankly she was a lot of the reason I got involved. So uh, my, my ties to Joanne go uh, much deeper than just tonight and it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege for me uh, to share this moment with her great family. Uh, I know they join me, I know my fellow legislators join me uh, and, and frankly uh, she is an inspiration not, not just to women, obviously she, she is an inspiration to women but she's an inspiration to us all. So thank you for joining us tonight as we honor this extraordinary woman and we have a plaque here which we are going to carefully unveil. And uh, we will proudly hang this plaque outside the doors. And uh, how about a big round of applause for Joanne and her family. Yeah, I would just <clears throat> really, really like to thank the legislature for uh, acknowledging my mom and everything that she did. She was uh, extremely dedicated to the community service that she that she did and, and everything. And she loved all the people she worked with. She loved the people she worked for. And uh, and I guess the two things about her that I remember more than anything else is her overwhelming sense of honesty and her dedication to uh, public service. And uh, once again, thank you very much. It's a wonderful acknowledgement. I'm very proud of everybody. Thanks. Joanne Van Zant was a great lady, 
If she hadn't been here, the world wouldn't be the same that it is right now. <laughs> Future politicians. This evening we have several proclamations scheduled. Madam Clerk. Would Owen McEntee please come forward? Also President Anthony J. Danielli, Legislator Mike Zale, Legislator Sean M. Delahanty, and Legislator Steve Brew. When a natural disaster strikes, it is often shadowed by layers of destruction and chaos. Earlier this year, Monroe County residents experienced a natural disaster of their own. This past March, a windstorm with gusts surpassing 80 miles per hour hit our region and left a path of fallen trees and electric lines, leaving thousands without power. And whereas, while many took cover under various forms of shelter, there were some that chose to face the storm head on in order to provide relief for county residents. The local villages of Spencerport, Fairport, and Churchville, which are all members of the Municipal Electric Utilities Association of New York State, each had dedicated employees who chose the latter. Alongside Rochester Gas and Electric, as well as surrounding MEUA municipalities, these three villages provided workers who courageously braced the high winds to, off to offer electric storm restoration to our region and its 100,000 plus residents that were without power. And whereas Monroe County is so fortunate to have such supportive and selfless community members, the electricians of these three municipalities have gone above and beyond to preserve the great quality of life in Monroe County. These men deserve to be recognized for the good that they have done for our residents and region alike. Now therefore, we, Anthony J. Danielli, President, Mike Zale, Legislator District 20, Sean M. Delahanty, Legislator District 11, and Steve Brew, Legislator District 12, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby recognize and congratulate the Municipal Electric Utilities Association of New York State for providing electricity restoration to Monroe County during the March 2017 windstorm. Well, we certainly uh, want to thank our, our local legislators and the body for this uh, recognition. I can say that uh, with the Municipal Electric Association, we've done a lot with emergency preparedness. There's 50 of us across New York, and of course, three here locally in Monroe County. And uh, recently, we put agreements together with uh, not only our own public power members, but also the uh, investor-owned utilities, meaning Rochester Gas and Electric. So, so now we have agreements in place and a process where we can really mobilize 50 linemen within a two-hour window. And that's a, that's a great asset, not only to our g and &E, but also to our customers and communities. So we appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.
Would Gary Zimmerman and Gwen Philip O'Mare please come forward? Also President Anthony J. Daniele and Legislator Steve Brew. Monroe County continually recognizes the accomplishments of outstanding citizens in our community. Individuals who endeavor to build and grow important organizations are the cornerstone of our community. And whereas the Black Creek Wildlife Station's dedication to the preservation and improvement to our environment is admirable. By caring to all wildlife and tending to these animals under the guidelines set forth by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the National Wildlife Rehabilitation Association, the New York Wildlife Rehabilitation Council, and consulting veterinarians, Black Creek Wildlife Station exemplifies profound environmental awareness and devotion to the betterment of Black Creek Park and surrounding area. And whereas, since being granted not-for-profits in 2005, Black Creek Wildlife Station has been a dedicated and committed organization to the care of sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife. Black Creek Wildlife Station founder and president Gary Zimmerman and vice president Gwen Phillips O'Mara have worked hard to continue their mission of returning each animal they care for to its natural habitat and to establish public awareness of the responsibility to wildlife through multiple public educational programs. And whereas Black Creek Wildlife Station has displayed a strong commitment to strengthening our community while making significant contributions to improvement of the Munner County community. Now therefore, we, Anthony J. Daniele, President, and Steve Brew, Legislator District 12, on behalf of the Munner County Legislature, do hereby recognize Gary Zimmerman and Gwen Phillips O'Mara from Black Creek Wildlife Station and outstanding citizenship and environmental contributions to our community. I wanted to recognize one other person that is um, Gary's wife, Trish Zimmerman, who worked with him for many, many years, and unfortunately, she um, passed away two, almost three years ago of cancer. But she was a very integral part in all of this, and I think that um, we should recognize her also. Okay, thank you. If he wants to stay. Would members of the Hippie Pandas please come forward? Also, President Anthony J. Daniele, Legislator Tracy DeFlorio, and Legislator Steve Brew. In 2009, six Girl Scouts and two coaches came together to create the Girl Scouts of Western New York first Lego League team, the Hippie Pandas. The first Lego League is an organization that inspires young people to be science and technology leaders and engage them in mentor-based programs that help develop skills in engineering, technology, communication, and self-confidence. And whereas the Hippie Pandas are a team dedicated to improving our community and our world using STEM, te teamwork, and creativity. This team of outstanding young women has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors over the past eight years, including the World Festival Teamwork Award, the Finger Lakes Regional Champions Award, and the Finger Lakes Churchville Chi Lai Champions Award. And whereas this year, the Hippie Pandas designed and programmed a robot that interacted with Lego mission models on a playing field. Their robot earned a nearly perfect score. In addition, the team investigated how to reduce the death of honeybees 
due to low temperatures and used their own invention to work towards a solution. While completing these tasks throughout the year, the hippie pandas demonstrated exceptional teamwork and professionalism. And whereas the innovation and imagination displayed by this team of young women is admirable and inspiring, these students of Churchville Chile Middle School and T.J. Connor Elementary School and their coaches have worked extremely hard to seek out opportunities to improve our world and have had outstanding success. Monroe County is a better place because of creative and talented inventors and pioneers who have come before us and will continue to be a great place because young people, such as the members of the Hippie Pandas, embrace the same values for science and innovation. Now therefore, we, Anthony J. Danielli, President, Tracy DeFlorio, Legislator District 3, and Steve Brew, Legislator District 12, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby recognize the Hippie Pandas for their outstanding accomplishments. I usually can't talk because I usually get choked up, so I'll get through this. But anyways, I want to say thank you to the legislature, um, especially uh, Tracy DeFlorio and Steve Brew for this honor, and also Monroe County for promoting STEM in our youth and by being a sponsor of the first robotics Finger Lakes Regional Competition. And I uh, also would like to say that our, te our team has, has been successful in our community because of the, out, the overwhelming support. There's not been anyone I asked who said no to these girls. So I'd like to say thank you to um, the different groups that we've worked with. We've worked at RIT with the Women in Computing, the Women in Engineer. We actually worked with the RIT Concrete Canoe Racing Team. Uh, we worked with uh, New York State Bee Wellness. We worked with Rochester's uh, Orthopedic Surgeons and uh, the National Arthritis Association we've worked with. We've worked with so many people, oh, the makerspace, and I could go on and on, but it's, no one has said no to these girls, and because of that, we're a better community, and I'd just like to say thank you. Would Michael Lopez please come forward? Also, President Anthony J. Danielli. Well, they're not here. <laughs> okay. How about the World of Inquiry boys soccer team? <laughs> okay. Also, President Anthony J. Danielli. Legislator Ernest Flagler Mitchell and Legislator Vincent Felder. Whereas it is the sense of this legislature to honor local sports teams that compete at a high level demonstrating success and good sportsmanship on the field of play and character both on and off. And whereas attendant to such concern and in full accord with long-standing tradition, these legislators are justly proud to honor the World of Inquiry Varsity Boys soccer team. And whereas the World of Inquiry Griffins have become respected for their on-field soccer success in Section 5, Class C, by achieving a rare championship three-peat. Led by head coach Rich Poffler and assistant coaches Jason Hetzler and Sarah Benjamin, the Griffins racked up an impressive 21-1 record as they marched through the regular season, sectionals, and state tournament, resulting in a berth in the state championship game. And whereas, despite the hard-fought 2-1 loss to North Salem in the final, the achievements of this team are many and extend beyond the soccer pitch. Collectively, the 21 members of this team hold a 3.32 grade point average to go with a 97.3% attendance rate. And whereas the lessons... <laughs> whereas
as the lessons learned in the classroom and on the field of play will continue to push these young men to greater success in our community in whatever they each choose to pursue in the future. Now therefore, let it be known that we, Anthony J. Daniele President, Ernest Flagler Mitchell, Assistant Minority Leader, and Vincent Felder, Legislator, do hereby honor the World of Inquiry Boys Soccer Team on this 13th day of June, 2017. Um, thank you. Real quick, we really appreciate this. Uh, uh, we're very welcome for the recognition. Thank you very much. There are no formal committee reports scheduled for this evening. At this time, we will hold a public forum, and we have uh, many people registered to address this legislature this evening, which we are happy for. Uh, however, given the number of speakers that we have, I would like uh, to remind everybody, as the clerk will in just a moment, uh, of two things. One, each speaker is permitted two minutes to speak, and out of respect to the speakers that will follow, Please make your comments brief and to the point. Shortly after two minutes, I will ask you to conclude your remarks, at which point your microphone will be shut down. Secondly, and again, out of respect for the audience and the many people that we have, uh, the speakers are on, I believe, in the hallway, so people out in the hallway can hear you. Um, and while we have a, a, an extended crowd in the back, that's fine. I appreciate the, everybody being here. I would like to remind you that loud cheering or jeering uh, or yelling of any sort following a speaker will not be tolerated. I do encourage you to affirm the speakers, uh, and you're welcome to clap after they speak. That's respectful and acceptable. Uh, anyone creating a disturbance will be asked to leave. So I, I appreciate your cooperation in advance, and at this time, Madam Clerk. If you require assistance, a deputy is available to assist you in approaching the lectern. I will call three people forward at one time. Each speaker will have two minutes in which to address the legislature and kindly conclude your remarks when the timer sounds and exit through the back of the chambers. Thank you for your cooperation. Our first three speakers will be Dr. Sanford Mayer, Charles Ennis, and Lauren Terry. Mr. President, uh, county legislators, I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I will be brief. <laughs> uh, I've been a, I'm Dr. Sanford Mayer. I've been a pediatrician in this community for 40 years. Doesn't seem like it. But uh, this has included several years serving in the Monroe County Foster Care Clinic, as well as working with child, children and legal advocates and high-risk children. I have great concerns about the growing number of uh, CPS reports in our community. It's predicted this year we might reach 10,000 reports. And the limitations being planned on our CPS resources, particularly the number of caseworkers with the unacceptable caseloads. Presently, the average caseload is 29, with the accepted national standard of being 12. Imagine, if you will, your child sitting in a classroom with one teacher and 60 students, or your child sick in the hospital with one nurse and 12 to 15 uh, sick kids. Uh, this obviously has a negative effect on caseworker for fatigue, burnout, and turnover, uh, requiring increased efforts in hiring and training to sustain this somewhat threadbare system. CPS is but one piece of the puzzle to provide an adequate safety net for our most vulnerable children. The long-term effects on these children are too numerous to discuss here in this forum, and we're well aware there is no quick fix. 
potential relief can be found by increasing funding, funding for more CPS workers, provide evidence-based home visitation services, and increased funding for CPS workers' professional development. So uh, uh, we increase job satisfaction and job retention. So I encourage you all to do so and think heavily about it because it's really important. Thank you. Hello. My name is Lauren Terry and I'm a casework supervisor with Child Protective Services. I have worked with CPS for the past 14 years and the most recent five and a half as a supervisor. I am here to tell the story of CPS in a different way by sharing the story of a special little girl. This child was born in August 2005 in California. Throughout the pregnancy, her mother tested positive for methamphetamines. At the age of six, she was removed from her parents' care by CPS in the state of Oregon due to domestic violence in the home, drug use in the home, and lack of food for the children. Despite her being taught from a very young age that you, you do not speak to people about what happens in the home, and especially not to CPS, this young girl had caseworkers who had the time to develop a trusting relationship with her. Although it took several cases before CPS could get her to talk about what was happening in her family, this girl finally felt safe enough to talk about being the primary caretaker of her three younger brothers, being closed in a bedroom, sometimes a closet, and looking through garbage for food to eat. It was due to this relationship with her caseworkers that she talked about these experiences, which led to her eventual placement in foster care. While in foster care, she was moved among six foster homes within three years, being separated from her brothers at times. Her parents engaged in no services to reunite with their four children, and due to the tireless and diligent efforts of her caseworkers, the rights of her parents were ultimately terminated and she was freed for adoption. Following a failed adoption placement, her adoption caseworker worked tirelessly to find her an appropriate adoptive placement. It was on November 17, 2014, that she came to Rochester, New York to be placed with her new family. Miraculously, and due to the amazing work by her caseworker in Oregon, one of her brothers also came to Rochester on that same plane to be united with his new adoptive mother. Although it was decided they should not be placed together for safety reasons, the caseworker recognized the importance of this relationship and worked to preserve it. When asked what would have happened to this little girl had she not found her forever home, the caseworker reported that she was on her last available foster home in that county. She would have ended up in residential care, costing Oregon hundreds of thousands more dollars per year. She likely would have ended up hospitalized for mental health care, possibly followed in her parents' footsteps of drug use, or ended up in prison, costing the taxpayers more money. But due to the tireless work of her caseworkers, she has a different and positive life outcome now. Although still working through her trauma, she cannot sleep without her adoptive mother beside her at night. She cannot go into the bathroom without someone outside the door to keep her safe. She still wakes up on occasion screaming, help me. She is a different person, a healing person. She is now almost 12 years old. She is finishing her sixth grade year at Berger Middle School in the Rush Henrietta School District. She just made honor roll for the first time. She is an artist. She is a cheerleader. Um, she is caring and sweet. She is smart. She is beautiful. She has a positive relationship with her little brother who now lives in Irondequoit with his adoptive mother. And most importantly, she is my daughter. On December 4th, 2015, my husband and I adopted this beautiful and amazing little girl. This is a true example of the miracles that can happen when CPS caseworkers have the time and resources to do their jobs. It is an example of what all children in this country, in this state, and in this county deserve for their future. It is what each and every caseworker in Monroe County strives for and why they work so many hours behind their workday. But to make this a reality for every child in this county, we need your support. We owe it to the children of this county. Thank you.
Our next three speakers are Dr. David Topa, Kathy Ruff, and Ellen McCallie. Good evening, my name is David Topa. I'm a pediatrician at Pittsburgh Pediatrics. I uh, have the honor of providing health care to over 500 families from mostly eastern side of town, uh, Penfield, Webster, Pittsburgh, Menden, Fairport, Brighton, and some areas of the city. I have a question for you. Do you remember what you were doing 15 years ago? Kind of a long way. You know, a lot of things have changed since then. I remember where I was 15 years ago, right here. Remember, in the uh, early to mid 2000s, we've had similar discussions in pretty much every budget session since. We've had discussions about what's the right way to protect kids. Are kids worth funding? And always we get up here as pediatricians and as child care advocates and we say, we need to do better and we need to do better now. Back then we were advocating for protective services. We were advocating for home nursing programs, foster care pediatrics. We even went so far as to develop a white paper, bring in child, care, child experts, scientists, uh, pediatricians to do a cost benefit analysis of each program. And we determined that yes, every dollar that we spend on these actually save money. Every dollar we spend may prevent unnecessary hospitalizations, unnecessary uh, trips to the doctor, unnecessary ED visits, unnecessary foster care placements, unnecessary deaths. Not only was the financial argument overwhelming, but so was the moral argument. But yet, we had to hold the line. We can't raise the tax levy. We can't raise the tax rate. Well now, our pre or your predecessors made this bed, and now you all are sleeping in it. And as a county, we are sleeping in it. We're spending more on CPS than we have in years. And so what we need to do is fix the system, put the money where we need it, and quit blaming everyone else. Remember, I know it's not your fault. It's not your constituent, constituent's fault that these kids are in the uh, situations that they are. But remember, it's not the kid's fault either. Thank you. My name is Kathy Ruff. I'm a supervisor in Child Protective Services. I started working for the county in 1991, so I have 26 years of experience all in CPS. I'm here again tonight because I remain extremely concerned with our inability to get our jobs done. We do not have enough caseworkers to do what is required. Since the last meeting on May 9th, at least eight more people have resigned. So I'm here to ask you, leaders of Monroe County, what is your plan? What is your plan for the vulnerable children and families of Monroe County? The children and families don't care which district you represent, which political party you identify with, or that I'm part of a union that hasn't had a fair contract to keep people employed here. What they care about is getting the help that is needed. We can't do the job we need to when CPS is in crisis. If we are in crisis mode, we cannot be effective with families who are also in crisis mode. I recently completed the mandatory Monroe County Ethics Training, and I scored 100%. I should feel proud of myself, but I don't. I feel like a fraud. The opening paragraph says public service means that Monroe County officers and employees put the needs of the public ahead of their own personal interest and gain. Are we doing that? It doesn't feel that way when workers have high caseloads and there aren't enough hours in the day to do, to do all that is mandated and asked of us. As a supervisor, I go home each night with an unfinished to-do list and a worry for my workers and the families we are responsible for. The training defined ethics as acting with an awareness of the need to comply with expectations of the community. The families of this community are suffering and expect us to respond and to care. They are being neglected because there are not enough workers to get the job done. The training also said one of the expectations of Monroe County employees is to perform the duties of their job in an honest, trustworthy manner. CBS does not have enough people to ensure the safety of our children, so we aren't being honest if we look the other way and not address this crisis and make a plan. I'm not sure why we are waiting to fix this mess or what we are even waiting for. And to be honest, I'm beginning to lose hope. 
I am pleading with each of you to make the changes necessary so people will want to work for CPS. The families of Monroe County deserve this. My name is Ellen McCauley. I have 34 years with the county, 22 as a child protective supervisor. Here's a snapshot in the day in the life of a CPS management team. 9 a.m., caseworker one, number one makes a home visit to check on a child. She realizes immediately she needs to do a removal as the child is unsafe. Two police officers and her supervisor, me, are called in to assist. Even with our help, caseworker number one gets punched and verbally abused on her way out of the house with the child. I transport him to Westfall Road. It's raining and the child has no coat. Caseworker number one meets me at the door with an umbrella. The boy has an acute disability. He's filthy, smelly, and has soaked through a diaper that's too small. Our clerk is ready with a pull-up. Two more caseworkers have a fresh outfit from their own clothes closet. The senior caseworker is doing paperwork for home finding, the team that recruits, trains, and manages 254 foster homes. Caseworker number five keeps him busy while caseworker number one is on the phone. Clerk number two sets up the DVD player. Caseworker number six calls potential foster homes. Administrator one contacts Hillside for a special therapeutic bed. Yours truly drafts an affidavit and emails it to our law department. Arrangements are made with SPCC uh, for the senior caseworker to take the child to the visitation center where he is happily showered and clothed. The senior caseworker buys him lunch out of her pocket because we don't have petty cash. Snacks are provided by the Youth Opportunity Unit. Administrator number two joins us and coordinates placement. Caseworker number one leaves to make arrangements for the baby brother who also needs placement and we are relieved at 450 by Hillside staff. One crisis, one family, two children. That month, my team of five had 41 families with 96 children. Court appearances alone took up 105 hours or the equivalent of three entire weeks of work. I lost two veteran staff this year to less stressful and better paying jobs. They've not been replaced. We now have 32 cases, 64 children, all under the jurisdiction and protection of Monroe County. Our kids, your kids. Our next three speakers are Chris Gillian, Melissa Guzowitz, and Kendra White. Hello, good evening. My name is Chris. I've worked for DHS for 12 years. I spoke at your last meeting in May and will continue to speak at upcoming meetings in the hopes of helping you to understand the extraordinary circumstances that DHS currently finds itself in. What does that mean? For instance, within the last month, I'm aware of at least seven people who have left our agency, combined for approximately 46 years of service. In our profession, experience equals child safety. This is why it is important to reward, inspire, and motivate. Reward experience. Don't lose those of us who know best about child safety. Inspire those fresh out of training whom you've already invested in to be a part of our ongoing mission of child safety. And lastly, motivate highly qualified applicants to join our team. When you address these three areas, this is when you can be sure that child safety is your priority. Tonight I have two letters written by a past intern and a previous caseworker. Though they are no longer with the agency, they remain committed to the children in our community, which is why they chose to write these letters. Jackie Ryan was a CPS intern during her 2015-2016 academic school year. She has taken the civil service exam and is currently working on obtaining her MSW. 
Her desire is to help our community with a focus on children and families. Jackie had thought about pursuing a career at DHS, though due to the unmanageable caseload and extreme stress, she may think otherwise. Jamie Lee White was a CPS caseworker from February 2016 until October 2016. She commented that despite having supportive supervisors and working with a great team, she, she had to leave. The main reasons were extremely large and at times unbearable caseload, along with low pay. Unmanageable and high caseloads does not equal child safety. In respect to the two minute time limit that I've run over, I will not be able to read what they have written. I've made copies for each of you in hopes that you would take an opportunity to read their stories. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Kendra White. I do want to read some of my story. Um, I am actually a former caseworker. I resigned on Friday for a lot of the reasons that you've already heard. Um, I did send a letter to some of our leadership and it reads as follows. When it comes to the end of a thing, it is the time that we often reflect on when and why we started in the first place. For me, it was a new thing, a noble thing, a needed thing, and an unknown thing, but it was also, sorry, it was also a, um, a first accomplishment, the first real job and potential career after receiving my bachelor's degree when I took on the role of caseworker, I had no idea what to expect, but learned quickly the importance of the work to be done. Even in that awareness and being able to perceive the duty and influence of my, my role afforded me, I remember my first week out of training being amazingly overwhelmed. I had a full caseload of 12 then and couldn't imagine how to manage getting any more cases as quickly as they were coming in. I went into an empty office and I cried. I felt defeated already. I recall a conversation that was supposed to be a comfort to me, instead causing me to rethink my decision. I had been told it takes two years to become a good caseworker, and this is just part of it. I wasn't happy because I had always been of the mindset that you can become great at anything you set your mind to, and if you have great leadership. For me, that was like hearing, I can't be that leader for you. Um, I want to jump down to a, another part because I know we have two minutes. Um, I left a team that 14 people, including myself, have left over the past four years um, because we were stressed out. We were completely unable to manage. Um, I want to talk about the community that we serve. <laughs> they hurl inserts, insults on us. They criticize our efforts. Um, we're continually being asked to do more by leadership with much less. Uh, we have substantially high caseloads. People are not able to maintain their heads, from coworkers to clients to community members. Mandatory overtime is put on us, and that stress that adds to the stress, and we're already stretched thin. In the last week alone, six caseworkers have quit. Um, I will talk about my injury at a home visit in January, where I still have a scar on my leg today and the not guilty verdict that was found for him for harassment by our, our legal teams here in Monroe County. And no support was given with that. So you've heard all of us kind of share the same story, but I wanted to give my personal account. But out of respect for the time limit, I'll end there. So please consider doing more to support the people that support your community as well. Good evening. My name is Melissa. Last month I shared with you my heart and passion in working with families in CPS. Since last month we have had seven, as I hear now, eight seasoned caseworkers resign from CPS. There is a new training class now, but that will not even fill the current vacancies, let alone the eight that have just left. This is simply unacceptable for our community and most importantly for the children at risk. We have a recruitment coordinator now to help draw new staff. Question is, are we going to get qualified and quality people interested in a job that someone is overworked and underpaid in? We cannot even maintain the staff that we have in place right now. 
This crisis in CPS is clearly a systemic issue in Monroe County as the high caseloads are across the board and not concentrated with just a few staff. Caseworkers are working mandatory overtime and still cannot keep their heads above water. How is this a service to the children we serve? The morale of staff continues to deteriorate and leads to more people seeking employment elsewhere. This is very sad as we have a diverse group of caseworkers from a variety of backgrounds and many with graduate degrees with experiences in other fields that they bring to the table in working with our families. We are wasting the knowledge and experience the staff brings when, we leave for a, when they leave for a better opportunity. Please hear our cries to you, our elected officials. Something needs to change. We are willing to work with you. Are you willing to work with us? Thank you for your time. Our next three speakers are Latanya Wilcox, Joanne Sassa, and Angela Ruffier. Good evening, I'm speaking on behalf of one of the CPS workers who asked me to read on their behalf, so that's what I'm going to do. Many people come to the legislator to talk about the work we do, requesting a raise, asking for more staff, and to work with the safe and supportive environment. I applaud the legislature for hiring more staff and approving to fill the vacancies quicker. It is honorable. I think that we overlook the low pay and not so great benefits and the dangerous situations new employees walk into. We can hire to fill positions, but with all the challenges you face, who would want to stay? Would you want to do our jobs? Is it really fiscally responsible to train staff that will leave because of poor work conditions and poor pay? Many of the staff believe that the job we do and stay because they truly want to make a difference. Even though we have not gotten raises in several years and our workers continue to buy kids that we are bringing into care a lunch because they might not have eaten all day or the day before. The staff do this knowing that they will not get reimbursed. Our workers go to high school and college graduations, often getting youth gifts that they have and pay out of the pocket. Our workers do this because the only gifts the youth will get will be from their worker. Did I mention that they do this on their own time? Recently, a worker assisted a youth to get his participation in government hours so the youth could graduate from high school. The youth was adopted this year, and the worker did this all without being paid. Also, there is a team that runs bagel sales weekly to raise money to all, so all youth on their team can get Christmas presents. These kids have no family supports and are going to live independently upon leaving care. If it wasn't for the gift from the team, these children would not get a Christmas present. We have numerous workers organizing community events that work with Boys and Girl Scouts. They volunteer on their neighborhood associations. The workers volunteer to check with students and their families to get better during attendance blitz. They do this because they know the children who go to school at an early age have a better chance of graduating from high school. Workers donate their time with United Way Day of Caring. Monroe County staff donate money, not just their time, to make our community a better place to live. And we still get offered contracts where we lose money eventually. Is that fair? Is it just? Many workers have part-time jobs to make ends meet. Our workers are not living extravagant lifestyles. Many struggle to make ends meet. Many workers, in spite of this, still continue to help. My hope is that you will help the workers continue to do what they do best, keep the children and families safe, ultimately making our community a much better place to raise families and live. There are 29 of you county legislators. Each of you is responsible for just over 3% of what goes on in this room. Thank you to those of you who do honor to your position. I will address the damaging effect that the county 
economic development department policies have on our county's fiscal health and moral character. The director of county economic development, Jeff Adair, has no innate or learned talent for handling this high position. Consider these situations under Adair's control. Sid Strassenberg at MCIDC rolls out huge tax breaks relief to hospitals to build branches in wealthy suburbs. Strassenberg allowed the supposedly private U of R to get over a third of a billion with a B pass-through entity tax break. Strassenberg, however, doles out a paltry $1,500 loan, I repeat, loan, to a returning veteran. Adair allows a person whose company has lost, lost over 60% of its value just this year, let alone what it lost last year, to head Comita. Vince Esposito at Finger Lakes Regional Council oversees a 30-member board. Over half of those board members take Comita and other tax relief assistance. Adair allows the family of a powerful county legislator to get public assistance for the family's marina and other businesses. I ask you, 29 legislators, to change the quality of leadership at the County Economic Development Department. Thank you. Hello. My name is Angela Ruffier, and I've been with the Office of Probation for nine years this month. I want to describe who and what probation is to all of you. The mission statement reads as follows. The Monroe County Office of Probation Community Corrections is a division of the Monroe County Department of Public Safety. Through the dedicated efforts of all of our staff and volunteers, we provide intake, assessment, investigation, and supervision services, including counseling and referral for the community, clients, victims, the judicial system, and public and private agencies. We are committed to protecting the public, assisting in judicial decision making, and promoting law-abiding behavior in a cost-effective manner. In addition to supervising both adult and juvenile offenders, we have a large number of programs and caseloads at probation, all of which were created to better protect the community. These include officers who write investigations for the court with recommendations for sentencing after interviewing offenders, their families, and the agencies with which they are involved. We have multiple caseloads designated to the intensive supervision of domestic violence offenders, a team dedicated to the supervision of sexual offenders, a mental health specific caseload for those with long-term pervasive mental illness. We have an arson caseload and two teams dedicated to the supervision of DWI offenders. We have a night watch program, the officers of which supervise violent offenders between the ages of 18 to 24 by monitoring their whereabouts, activities, and adherence to their court-ordered curfew. We have an electronic monitoring or EM team who oversee the installation and supervision of those sentenced to electronic monitoring, home confinement, and GPS. We recently had a probation canine program, but unfortunately we lost our canine officer after he left our agency for a higher paying position with New York State Parole. We have a team dedicated to serving warrants on both probation violators and in collaboration with other agencies, they serve non-probation warrants throughout the city. We have a team who works specifically with the victims of domestic violence to aid them in obtaining orders of protection. And we have intensive supervision programs for juveniles as well as diversion programs to attempt to keep youth out of the system through linkage with resources and supervision by officers. Our department continues to research and develop new programming and strategies to supervise both adult and juvenile offenders with our ultimate goal always being the protection of the public. Please remember the public isn't just people living in Monroe County, it's you, it's me, it's our friends, and it's our families. I want to thank you for taking the time tonight to hear about our work. We're a dedicated and proud group of people, and I know that you see the value in what we do. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Wendy Turco, Jennifer Rivers, and Jim D'Amico.
Hello, my name is Wendy Turco, and I have been a Monroe County Probation Officer for 16 plus years. First of all, I want you all to know I love my job, and I am proud of the work that we do. However, it has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. As said earlier in our mission statement by Angela, we are committed to protecting the public. I would like to describe to you some of the special details that we run with other law enforcement agencies in an effort to promote public safety. We have the GIVE program. Many of you might not know what that is, but that is the Gun Involved Violence Elimination Program. We conduct enhanced home visits and search warrant details. All are focused on probationers with documented gun histories, very violent probationers. These enhanced home visits are above and beyond the state regulated amount of home visits that we need to do. The search warrant detail is also made up of probationers with documented gun history, but focus on, focuses on arresting them for violations of probations or other new gun offenses. We also have a multi-agency warrant detail. We have officers who go out with other law enforcement agencies such as RPD, the U.S. Marshals, the Monroe County Sheriff's Office, state police, and parole to serve these warrants. We work alongside these officers, and yes, I have worked alongside these officers doing the same job, but we are making approximately two and a half times less, putting our lives on the line as well as these other officers. We have a sex offender Halloween detail that we do every Halloween. We conduct home visits of these convicted sex offenders, not just in my neighborhood or in the city, but in every neighborhood in this county. We do this to increase community safety and hold these offenders accountable. If we don't do it, nobody else is going to. We have a bike patrol. These team of, this team of probation officers, they go to the same training as other law enforcement agencies and are called upon by RPD to assist them in festivals such as the Lilac Festival, the Puerto Rican Festival, the Charlotte Festival, and that's only to name a few. We also do DWI surveillance. That kind of speaks for itself. As Angela mentioned, we also had a canine officer. He left for a higher paying position as a parole officer. In closing, I would like to say that we did not get into this profession to get rich, we know that. However, I believe we should be compensated based on our education. We have to have a minimum, a minimum of a bachelor's degree. Most of us have social work degrees, graduate degrees. Um, we need to, you know, our job duties themselves need to be compensated and also we have to be comparable to other probation departments in the county or in other counties, I should say, because we're losing too many of our experienced probation officers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Rivers, and I have been with the Office of Probation for eight and a half years. Community supervision is a unique profession that is often challenging, but can also be rewarding. Probation officers must delicately balance several roles, including social worker, therapist, and law enforcement, to name a few. We are committed to protecting the public, assisting in judicial decision making, and promoting law-abiding behavior in a cost-effective manner. Currently, our office supervises approximately 5,400 probationers, while the Monroe County Jail houses approximately 1,400 inmates. A day's stay in jail costs approximately $144.66 per inmate. For you math majors, that's $52,800 per year, which is more than my annual salary. However, the cost for those sentenced to probation's electronic monitoring program is $5.20 a day, or $1,898 per year, which is a 96% savings to the county. Another important function of probation's efforts to keep the community safe includes our search team. From January 1, 2007 to December 31, 2016, our search team has seized 343 guns. 649 edged weapons, such as knives and swords, 23,960 rounds of ammunition, and $225,630 worth of drugs. Probation is a cost-effective and worthwhile sanction. However, what once was a sought-after career has now become a stepping stone for better opportunities with higher pay. 
Within the last three years, there has been a mass exodus of seasoned officers, which is detrimental to our department and will inevitably have a negative impact on public safety in our community. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jim D'Amico and I'm president of CSEA Unit 7400, the Monroe County full-time unit, which represents the Office of Probation. I'm here tonight to address the staffing issues as they relate to the Office of Probation. In 2005, the county budget allocated for 144 total probation officers. In 2017, it's been reduced to 128 total officers budgeted, a reduction of 16 officers since 2005. That represents a staffing reduction of over 11%. We currently have 106 total probation officers on staff, which is 22% less than the current budget allows for, and 38 positions less than what was budgeted for in 2005, a 27% reduction. This is a result of officers leaving the Monroe County Office of Probation and vacancies not being filled. Since 2004, 31 officers have retired and 11 have left for opportunities with higher pay in other law enforcement agencies. Since 2014, we have hired 26 new officers, 15 of which were hired over the last nine months. At that time, nine months ago, the average caseload in adult supervision was 125. That caseload now has increased by 14% to an average caseload of 145 offenders. These caseloads include offenders convicted of felonies, misdemeanors, those convicted of sex crimes, domestic violence, DWI, and arson. All told, the Office of Probation supervises just under 5,400 adult offenders. As a point of reference, the Monroe County Jail houses 1,350 inmates. Since January 2013, the Office of Probation has completed 3,000 57 overflow investigations due to the shortage of officers designated to complete them. Overflow investigations are the reports ordered by the court that cannot be assigned to the designated investigation officers because their, their caseloads are already at maximum plus capacity. While the role of probation is monitor and rehabilitate offenders, their primary role is to ensure the safety of the public. With 145 cases per officer and additional tasks assigned due to staffing shortages, it's only a matter of time before probation joins parole and CPS in the headlines for failing the community. I hope this body recognizes the severity of this crisis and does everything in its power to ensure the public safety of our community by lobbying for all those positions to be filled immediately. Please don't wait for the inevitable public safety issue to happen before doing your elected duty to protect our community. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Ann Lenane, Elaine Johnson, and Bridget Hurley. Can everyone hear me? Um, my name is Anne Linane, and I'm a pediatrician at the University of Rochester. Since 1993, I've been working in the area of child abuse pediatrics. Is this better? <laughs> Which um, has allowed me the privilege of working with CPS or Child Protective Services caseworkers over all those years. I want to just um, preface this by saying um, that we should not be short-sighted. Evidence-based prevention programs are really the key to solving the problem of child abuse in our community. But I want to address what's going on in Child Protective Services because that's what I see in my work every day. Over the last few years, I've noticed that the caseworkers I work with are getting higher caseloads, no more support necessarily, 
And um, the workers that I work with are part of a team that investigates serious child physical abuse, child sexual abuse, and child fatalities. So their cases are um, gut-wrenching um, most of the time, very complicated and difficult. Some of those caseworkers um, have carried caseloads as high as 50 cases at a time. And as you heard before, the recommended number is 12. Um, these excellent caseworkers are burning out and leaving Child Protective Services for um, jobs that pay better and allow them better work conditions. And um, I have to say that in all the years that I've been doing this, this is the worst that I've ever seen it as far as high caseloads, high stress, low staff, and low morale. Um, I know that the county is currently making efforts to hire more caseworkers, to provide more trainings, to um, provide efforts to retain caseworkers, but I really feel like these efforts are going to fall short, especially based on the things that I've heard from other caseworkers who have um, already spoken here tonight and what I hear from the team that I work with every day. I think that there has to be um, some mechanism for benchmarking with um, other counties and other agencies that manage to successfully retain social social workers in positions, bless you, um, may be spending time um, talking with the seasoned CPS caseworkers about what it would take to keep them in their jobs and to hire more caseworkers, and doing exit interviews on caseworkers that are leaving to see why they're leaving and what it would have taken for them to stay in their jobs. I think that this is really important for maintaining the safety net that Child Protective Services provides. Again, as you heard from other caseworkers, they are the final safety net for our most vulnerable children, and this is something that all of our children deserve. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Elaine Johnson, and uh, I'm a member of the Interfaith Collaborative of the Children's Agenda. I stand before you to appeal for increased funding in the Nurse Family Partnership Program. Let me first commend this body for the support you've provided through the years for this innovative program. Its proven effectiveness warrants its use everywhere, but we know that is not the case. So kudos to Monroe County for making it happen here. At a time when we see a substantial increase in reported child abuse in our county, we must provide the preventive services necessary to respond. However, it has been my experience as a retired clinical social worker that uh, under financial strain, our budgets demonstrate the opposite occurs. Funds for preventive services seem to take the first hit. Yet preventive services, and especially the Nurse Family Partnership Program, save taxpayers money. This is not news to anyone here. It is demonstrated over and over again, and statistics prove it. For example, the average cost of delivery of a healthy full-term baby is just over $4,000. The average for a premature baby is over 10 times that. The study, Status of Birth Outcomes in Clients of Nurse Family Partnership, shows a significant reduction in preterm births, as well as in the numbers of mothers breastfeeding, keeping immunizations updated, and fewer unintended pregnancies uh, sub subsequent to that first. In addition, research on the effectiveness of NFP shows a 59% reduction in child arrests at age 15, 39% fewer injuries among children, 56% reduction in emergency room visits for accidents and poisonings, and a 48% reduction in child abuse and neglect. Let me repeat that. A 48% reduction in child abuse and neglect. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I am not going to um, say what I thought I was going to say tonight because there's really not a lot I can add to what has already been said here tonight. Um, I will, though, say just um, a couple of things. One is, um, after hearing stories over the past few months, in, including ones we heard tonight from caseworkers, I really wonder whether next month we shouldn't have them up here being honored the way other folks are honored here because they are first responders. And I don't know 
if it's because they don't wear a uniform or what, but I don't feel that they get the respect that they deserve. Um, and I don't feel that they're valued for the really, really important work that they do. Um, the second thing is that I have, um, as you know, been working on this issue for a while. I completely understand how complicated the child welfare system is. I know these are really tough cases and tough families and tough issues. Um, and so, and I appreciate, um, as someone said earlier, what the county is doing. And I know that, that DHS is taking steps to address this crisis. Unfortunately, it's not enough. And so I just want to offer two very simple things that could be done that would make a difference. Um, one is what Elaine just said in terms of uh, nurse family partnership and other preventive programs. There's been lots of cuts to preventive programs over the past few years. And I think if we started to restore those, we might see the number of um, CPS reports drop. Um, and the second is very simple, and that's just to raise the salaries so that we could attract qualified workers. Thank you. Our last speakers are Martha Winhaber, Melody Warham, Jill Quartz, and Dan McDonald. My name is Martha Winhaber, and I'm angry at CPS. Poor CPS, no, poor children. I am here today for a child dear to my heart, but not only for this child, but for every child that speaks out and or is silenced or both. I will just touch on my concerns today, but I will not be silenced. CPS is allowing our children to die. CPS is not properly trained. They are not all-knowing experts and routinely fail. CPS is removing children from good homes and putting them with abusers. CPS routinely ignores the statistics. Children's lives are threatened if they report abuse. Parents rarely lie about abuse, especially to CPS or authorities, for custody or because they are crazy or devious. CPS is ignoring children's abuse disclosures and the evidence. CPS, on av children on average do not disclose abuse for five years. CPS is taking the stance of covering their mistakes to prevent lawsuits and this is not working for them. CPS does lie, they answer to their supervisors and they cover abuse. I know this because I am a survivor. Two words, training and accountability. That's it, thank you. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. My name is Melody Warham, and I am currently serving in the New York Army National Guard. I have been in the military for seven years now and served one tour of duty. This quote holds true for not only race, but gender, ethnicity, and other categories as well. As a veteran, why should I not be given privileges for something I have earned instead of something I was born into? Why not judge us by the content of our character and our selfless service? Why not give us something, why not give something to a veteran who has given their life for this country and given the people of the US the freedom they are able to enjoy today? The New York State Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business Act was passed in 2014. We are also asking that the county to adopt this bill to help those who have helped you. 
As a female veteran, I have just recently graduated with my bachelor's in accounting, and I hope to one day open my own CPA firm. Why should I not get the help I deserve after signing my life over to this country at 19 years old? Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. President Dinelli uh, and legislators for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this morning, this afternoon. My name is Jill Quartz. I am also the president for the Veterans Business Council. Our mission is to empower military veterans in business through leadership, service, and relationships. A large part of this is advocacy. I am here addressing you in this capacity for our 400 plus current and past members, at least half of those are acting business owners. I am also a US Navy veteran and business owner myself. So why are we here? We are asking that Monroe County simply adopt New York State's Service Disabled Veteran Owned Business, Small Business Act, and also include and match that designation with the, with the goal to award uh, these service disabled veteran owned businesses with bids. Please note that this is a state approved goal, not a mandate. I've heard the objection to this designation that it's not supportive of capitalism. To this I offer, these contracts are highly competitive and they are based on performance and delivery. Co competition is the cornerstone of a free market, free market economic system. I've learned this through attending uh, several PTAC workshops that these are competitive bids in their environment and setup. If the business, regardless of designation, falls short on their delivery, they will be denied future contracts. The other argument I'd like to add. Um, that there is already the MWBE designation with a target of 12% for Monroe County contracts. Therefore, I invite you to consider matching the New York State Small Service Disabled Veteran Owned Business Act um, as a preference, one that is not based on the compos composition of one's genetics, but earn it is an earned right through service and investment into our nation's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. As you know, military service instills a set of solid core values of work ethic, discipline, leadership, and culture, and a culture of improvise, adapt, and overcome, synonymous characteristics with entrepreneurialism. With that, again, thank you for your, this opportunity, for your attention and listening and your consideration. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dan McDonald. First of all, I'd like to say next month marks my one-year anniversary of coming here, um, unfortunately. As we know, last month we, we remembered Memorial Day. I kind of begin to wonder if we are remembering. Um, as you know, Jill addressed one of the questions that came up. You now have your answer. How many businesses? 400 divided by two, as in half. We have 200 businesses plus that are veteran-owned. And I will tell you this in my own business, our survey department is 100% veteran employed. Um, I have to be honest, and I've tried to keep my tone down, but some of the questions that came to me were, and, and I was insulted, one of the questions was, how do we know if this is not going to be a, a cover-up? You can't cover up a veteran. They have to have a DD-214, they have to be approved by the CVE at the VA or at the state level. So a cover-up's not going to happen. Um, Again, on the capitalism thing, I think that's been addressed. We have other programs in place. Were we not worried about them before? One of the questions was, how many numbers do we have? Do we have the numbers on some of the other programs before? I think the old saying goes, if you build it, they will come. I don't understand what more we need to talk about on this. There's no money involved. We have a program in place at the state level to certify these businesses. Nassau County has done it. They've had good success. I don't understand. I mean, I'm getting the feedback as to what really is happening. And I don't want to come out and say those kind of things. And I've always been, quote, unquote, politically correct every time I've been, been here. But I, I just, I'm, I'm at all as to what's really going on. I, I just, I, I'm in shock. But uh, again, please try to show us the courage that we all showed you. 
Thank you. This concludes the public forum. Thank you all for your uh, respectful cooperation during that public uh, forum. Thank you. We will now proceed with the consideration of motions, resolutions, and notices. Will the clerk please read the next item on the agenda? Item number two, referral 17-0158. Moved by Legislator DeFlorio, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number three, referral 17-0159. Moved by Legislator DeFlorio, seconded by Legislators Michike, Boyce, Terp, Zale, Howland, Taylor, and Draw. This is for introductory purposes only. Next item, please. Item number four, referral 17-0159. Moved by Legislator DeFlorio, seconded again by Legislators Michike, Boyce, Terp, Zale, Howland, Taylor, and Draw. This is a motion to table. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item is tabled. Next item. Item number five, referral 17-0159. Moved by Legislator DeFlorio, seconded by Legislators Michike, Boyce, Terp, Zale, Howland, Taylor, and Draw. This is to set a public hearing. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number six, referral 17-0160. Moved by Legislator Michike, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number seven, referral 17-0161. Moved by Legislator Michike, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Uh, before we ask for discussion, I believe there was a uh, clerical error on the referral that you may have received, but it is corrected in tonight's uh, packet on your tablet. But I will ask the administration just to clarify what's different so that we all have that. Thank you, Mr. President. The The amount in the uh, funding paragraph, Section 2, it says uh, $482,000. That's a uh, Scrivener's error. That should be 428721 to match the uh, same amount in Section 1. Okay. So that has been corrected clerically, but I just, uh, is there any discussion? No, no, there you go. There being no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number eight, referral 17-0162. Moved by Legislator Michike, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number nine, referral 17-0163. Moved by Legislator Michike, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 10, referral 17-0164. Moved by Legislator Zale, seconded by Legislator Michike. This is to adopt. Legislator Barat. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, through you to the administration, I have uh, one brief question. Uh, this is uh, in regards to intermunicipal um, agreements and contracts with the fire agencies. My question is, approximately how many fire agencies are we talking about here? Through the Chair, Deputy Public Safety Director, Tim Kohlmeyer, uh, 33 agencies. Thank you. Finally, through the uh, President to the administration, of, uh, am I correct to assume that those 33 agencies cover all the local agencies and they include them all? Is that correct? Through the Chair? Through the Chair, that's correct. President? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 11, referral 17-0165. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislators Michike and Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 12, referral 17-0166. Moved by Legislator Taylor, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 13, referral 17-0167. Moved by Legislator Taylor, seconded by Legislator Draw. This again is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Legislator <coughs> Muyo. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have a number of questions, or at least one question. Uh, during committees, uh, I raised the issue that this was an increase of almost 50% from uh, 2015 to 2016 in terms of rabies cases. And the answer that was given was that it's possible that um, there was more awareness of the Monroe County program that increased participants or people who were treated through Monroe County. Uh, so my question through the president is whether uh, there are the, our surrounding counties uh, have seen an increase that's uh, in the same manner as what we've seen in Monroe County. Uh, through you, Mr. President, uh, our, our belief is that, yes, that is true. Thank you. Just as a clarif clarifying question, then, through you, Mr. President, it, there's been a 40 per to 50 percent increase in surrounding counties in rabies treatments. Is, is, is that what you just confirmed? Thank you. Uh, no, I, I do not know the exact number. I can get that for you, though, if you want. It's, thank you. It, is the statement, then, that there's no indication that we know about surrounding counties' rabies increases or decreases? Through the president? Through the chair, my understanding is that it has increased, but I do not know the magnitude of that increase. Okay, thank you. I'd appreciate being provided with that. Is there any other discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? <coughs> item carries. Next item. Item number 14, referral 17 0168. Mo moved by Legislator Draw, seconded by Legislator Hebert. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 15, referral 17-0169. Moved by Legislator Draw, seconded by Legislator Hebert. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 16, referral 17-0171. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislator Draw. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? There being no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 18, referral 17-0173. Moved by Legislator Marionetti, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Uh, before we get to discussion, there's a couple things I just wanted to clarify. Um, since this is my referral submitted. Uh, and just for the record, four weeks ago, uh, there was a technical oversight that was brought to my attention. I immediately contacted the law department and worked closely with the county administration on this matter. And after determining that the work of the Comita board was valid and lawful, the county executive immediately asked the law department to work in conjunction with my office to do a comprehensive assessment of this matter, which began instantly. Over the course of the last four weeks, we have not only identified the contents of the resolutions that you see before you tonight, but we also have identified a process to move forward and ensure that the oaths of office for public officers are filed promptly after appointment. This process will include the law department taking the lead and making sure the board appointee and the county clerk are notified of appointments of public officers. Regarding this resolution and the county executives that will follow, we will be discussing after this one. I want to let these le this legislature know that the purpose of this item is to reappoint these individuals to the boards that they are serving currently on. They have already been approved by this honorable body in the past, and with the passage of this resolution tonight, the 30-day window for these individuals to file the, an oath of office will be reset. And with that, uh, is there any discussion? Legislator Morelli. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. I do have uh, several questions in regards to this. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to know, how is it determined who and which positions must file an oath of office and where it is to be filed? Through you, Mr. President. Uh, through you, Mr. President, the Law Department, myself working with several attorneys, First of all, review the law. There's a number of different factors to consider to determine if a position is a public office. It is absolutely not crystal clear. A determination has to be made. We reviewed all of the positions. They, in Monroe County, 
the oaths of office uh, are filed in the county clerk's office by law. Thank you. And through you, Mr. President, um, who is it in this room that is responsible for filing those oaths of office? Uh, through you, Mr. President, nobody in this room. So, so through you, Mr. President, there's no one, whether it be the uh, majority staff or the county administration who is responsible for making sure that those signed oaths get to the county clerk's office? Is that what I'm led to believe? Through the president, uh, there's no requirement that any particular person uh, in this room do that, but as uh, the president indicated, we have a process going forward that the law department really, uh, me, uh, will ensure that those are done. Through you, Mr. President, why is it that it ha isn't until now that we're understanding that this is something that's supposed to happen? I mean, why, why was this not done in the past as a standard procedure? I believe in, in, in most cases uh, it was done and typically it was done at the specific board level. Uh, each board uh, in most cases, again, uh, took the responsibility to make sure that an oath was filed for the newly appointed members. Obviously there were some cases where that either didn't happen or didn't happen promptly enough. Uh, and so the purpose of this resolution today is, is to make sure, first of all, uh, that those, uh, those errors are corrected uh, and obviously going forward and most importantly uh, that we don't have this happen again. Through you, Mr. President, any idea how long this has gone on that we haven't been filing oaths with the clerk's office? Through the President's, some oaths of office have been filed, but the uh, the concern that we're looking at right now has gone on for decades. And at my request, we examined the current boards, so I, I didn't go back farther than that. And through you, Mr. President, um, since um, we've obviously need to reappoint these people this evening, um, how long, I mean, I, I understand that uh, the items that were um, approved in these boards stands um, and there's no legal bearing from what I've read uh, through luckily the newspaper provides um, information to this body. Um, it, it's my understanding that everything that they voted on is is um, is legal but I do have a question as to the several boards that were canceled this past month. Through you Mr. President, how many boards was it that were canceled uh, that their that their regular monthly meetings were canceled? Through the president, on this referral to. I'm oh, sorry. Could you repeat for, that? Regarding the item on this referral, there are two boards on this referral uh, that the, the the meetings were postponed. Thank you, Mr. President. And through you, how much um, county business was delayed uh, because of uh, the cancellation of these meetings? Through the president, none. Through you, Mr. President, then why did we have the meeting if n nothing was going to be done with those items? Was there no business to come before the meetings, or was it canceled because we realized that the oaths of office hadn't been filed? Through the President, the meetings were adjourned at the recommendation of the law department until these uh, positions were reappointed and oaths could be filed. So through you, Mr. President, then there was likely some county business that didn't happen because the boards weren't in place. Is that correct? Through the President, no. Through you, Mr. President, this particular referral approves um, the Comita Board. Was there any, is there any economic development um, projects in Monroe County that were delayed because Comita was in meeting? Through the president, no. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would um, like a better understanding as to why, Mr. President, four weeks ago, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, four weeks ago you discussed with the um, administration um, and perhaps your staff um, the the issue that had come to light because of a, a news report. Uh, 
why is it then, Mr. President, that we didn't find out we were reappointing these people until yesterday around 4.45 in the afternoon? Uh, because it was yesterday afternoon that the referral was complete, and obviously uh, it wasn't my intent to submit a referral to this body until I had a fair level of confidence uh, that the boards had been gone through from top to bottom and make sure that uh, we do this once uh, and not done haphazardly. Uh, I did make a statement publicly four weeks ago, give or take, uh, shortly after this matter was brought to public attention stating that it was my intent as the president of this body uh, to take care of this matter at this meeting. So to the extent that you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't submitted to this body in a formal notice, but it was made public that it was the intent uh, to get that done at this time. And through you, Mr. President, do you find it unnecessary for perhaps members of this body to be briefed on such items when you're giving those, uh, that information out to the public? Do you, do you not see reason to perhaps let, well, I, I can't speak for your side of the aisle, but my side of the aisle to be included on these items? There, there were several legislators on my side that reached out to me and asked, and I did discuss it with them. I don't recall uh, any legislator from the minority side of the aisle who asked any questions. And through you, Mr. President, would it not be a courtesy to perhaps reach out to our side of the aisle to provide them information on a conversation you had with the county executives team four weeks ago? No, because at that time I was asking questions. Would, so. you, would you, Mr. President, then say that perhaps this was a quote unquote nothing burger and that it really had no standing? I don't think I used that word, but um, you know, my primary concern when it came to light was the validity of the decisions that were made by those boards. That was my first question. Uh, and second question was how do we make sure that it gets fixed? And third, how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? And I believe this referral uh, addresses those three most critical issues, and uh, I'm confident in how we move forward. Through you, Mr. President, it's my understanding that uh, members of several of these boards um, were notified last week that they were going to be reappointed. Why is it then that if they knew last week, we as legislators weren't notified about this until last night? because that's when the referral was submitted to this body. And th then through you, Mr. President, why was it that, that when the board, at the board level, they were told about their uh, soon-to-be reappointments, our body wasn't notified? No. I agree. Through, Mr. President, I, 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 would, I would say that it wasn't answered because you haven't told us why other people knew before this body knew. It is customary before I submit a resolution to this body of making any type of appointment uh, that I discuss the matter with the candidate and the person whose name will appear on the referral. I wouldn't submit a referral prior to having a discussion uh, with any individual. I wouldn't want them to find out um, through a press release or uh, other, other matters and other ways of communication that are frankly less formal and uh, less appropriate. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm just going to um, make a statement. Um, you know, I, as I read in the newspaper and see on TV what the county executives team refers to as a quote unquote nothing burger. So I went ahead and um, did a little research this afternoon and uh, went to dictionary.com to see what exactly a nothing burger was. It turns out you can't find what a nothing burger is. But if you do go to Urban Dictionary, um, you can find out what a nothing burger is. So I thought I would share that with you. It is something that is, quote, something lame, insignificant, a, quote, dud. Mr. President, uh, I don't think that anything we do here is lame, insignificant, or um, in any way a dud. We are county lawmakers. We are supposed to be looking out for the people of our community. We had a packed house here tonight, although it seems most of them have left, about issues that are surrounding the county. And we continue to put out or have these fires that need to be put out, which are 
what the, what the county executive's team considers to be nothing of importance. We're not following the law. We are not following New York State law in making sure that oaths of office are properly filed with the county clerk's office. Now, it would seem to me that since the county executive is the former county clerk, she would have understood that that needed to happen, but it's not, and it hasn't for perhaps decades. And Mr. President, I would say that not only does it make the county executive's team look bad, it makes our body look bad. That we as the county legislature is not fulfilling our duty to provide, to, to follow state law and make sure that oaths are properly submitted with the county clerk's office. When I read the county, county clerk Bellows comments yesterday, all I could think about is he's not only saying some negative things against the administration, he's saying negative things about all of us, both sides of the aisle. He didn't say this is just a Republican thing or this is just a Democratic thing. He said this is a county legislature's thing. So, Mr. President, I think it's extremely important that you and your team, as you are the majority and run the business of this chamber, ought to be checking that you are crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And I would say shame on all of us for letting this slip through. And uh, I certainly hope that what you and the county executive's team and the law department agreed upon four weeks ago um, is something that we will continually follow. But Mr. President, you could rest assured that our side of the aisle isn't going to let something like this happen again without asking more questions. I mean, we've asked questions on all types of things and don't get much response, but I think it's important that moving forward, we don't make these kinds of nothing burger mistakes. Thank you, Mr. President. Legislator Lightfoot. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, I just want some clarification on what we're um, talking about doing here. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President. Just can you, Mr. President, you or the staff tell me um, about more in detail of what the 30-day reset means, uh, more particularly those that have been serving on these boards, do these uh, board dates reset now? So if they were serving a two-year term, they have already served nine months. Do they two-year term starts again and there's a new date, or is this still the same, or what, what is it all about? Uh, through the president, uh, some of these board members, Kamita, for example, are appointed without a term. Uh, the water authority board members are reappointed to their existing terms. Um, and the same with the MCC trustees. The fact of reappointment will trigger a 30-day time period within which the oath has to be filed. So, Mr. President, I, I didn't, um, not to be hard, I, I'm just, I just didn't quite understand. Without saying the 30-day reset, because I don't even know what that really means to me. If, so some of these authorities, uh, Water Authority and MCC board members that currently are already serving, you know, do they start over again or do, do they continue in their existing I think I heard you say that, that they continue in their existing positions, but the term limit, they have already started that. So did that go to zero or does it continue on to where they are? Through you, Mr. President. Through you, Mr. President, the appointees in this referral that have terms are being reappointed to the existing terms. They're not resetting to the beginning of the term, it's to the existing term and the same end date that they were appointed to originally. So then they, so just thank you for that. And so then through Mr. President, if they were expected to terminate in some future date that is, you know, I think I got it now. Thank you. Thank you, legislator. Legislator Muyo. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, to 
piggyback on Legislator Lightfoot's questions. I guess I, what I'm hearing from you, Mr. President, is a, a very careful statement that these individuals are being reappointed and that you're not filling a vacancy. Is, is that a, a difference that, that you see? Uh, they're, they're being reappointed for the purposes of resetting the clock so that they can take their oath of office. <clears throat> is, is, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Through you, or unless you're going to answer this question, is there a reading of the law that says that once these oaths have not been filed after 30 days after appointment that the, the seat becomes vacant and that you'd be filling a vacancy? Was that entertained by the law department in any way through you, Mr. President? Through the president, yes, and we determined that these people could be reappointed to their existing terms. Thank you for restating that, but how did you come to that through you, Mr. President? How was that, how was that decision come to? Through the president, it's through research and a legal judgment. Thank you. And was that, uh, through you, Mr. President, was that your legal judgment? Is that something that can be shared with this body, or is that something that cannot be shared with this body? Through the president, yes, it is my legal judgment, and I am sharing it with this legal body by saying that, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, through you, Mr. President, is there a certain amount of work product? Was there a memo that was written and uh, an analysis done of the relevant statute, or is, did, was it just read in your own mind and then decided upon aloud? Through the president, there has been a significant amount of legal research and analysis resu resulting in these referrals being written the way they are. Thank you. And my question is, is, is that something that you'd be willing to offer to me to review through you, Mr. President? Quit that question. Uh, in response, no, he has not answered that question. Please restate the question. I'm wondering if that work product, that analysis that was possibly done in writing, would be available to this legislature because I, I simply disagree with, with that legal conclusion through you, Mr. President. President, what, what I said or what I was trying to say is that the written work product is the referral and it includes the uh, description that these board members are being reappointed to the existing term and that's a legal judgment. There's not a separate written memo that I could give you to review on that. Okay, thank you. No, I understand. <clears throat> I have no more questions. Is there any other discussion? Legislator Marionetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just rise to make a statement. It, it's already been said here tonight, but you know, clearly we're talking about an oversight. Um, but it's also become clear that you yourself, Mr. President, along with the administration, has taken steps to act quickly to rectify the problem and also possibly more importantly to even ensure that going forward steps are taken to avoid it. So I guess what I'd like to say is thank you for taking that quick action. You know, I, I guess I would hope that we could all agree that the most important thing is we try and rectify the oversight and uh, prevent it from occurring in the future. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Any other discussion? Legislator Brock. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, through you to the administration, um, I do have a, a question or two. And it was stated in, uh, uh, earlier that this referral was laid out in such a way that it includes those individuals who, for whatever reason, did not um, sign the oath. Is, is that correct? These only are the ones who need to sign the oath to be um, considered in compliance with New York State law. Is that correct? Uh, that's, cor that's correct. Uh, they either did not file an oath of office or we couldn't prove that they did. Fair enough. Then my question then through you or to you or through you to the administration, on this referral, number 173, and I'm willing to do both at the same time, um, that, that means that there were 12 um, board members who did not, for whatever reason, or could not be proven. And in the next, um, on 175, there's 26 board members who did not, or we can't prove it. It's for a total of about 38 that we could not prove. My question is, how many did in fact comply with New York State law board members? So the two referrals combined, 38 did not, X number did, how many is it, what is the X number? How many actually are in compliance? How big was, how widespread was the challenge? 
treading on thin ice because I prefer not to combine the two, but I can, you know, it's probably going to get this. I'm happy to split them out. Understood. Uh, I mean, we so we examined dozens of different boards that have many members. Some some boards are fairly large boards, um, and not all of them required the oath of office. So, you know, if you start adding that number of people that didn't need to take it. I don't know, uh, Mr. Davis. Do you have? I don't have a number to give you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, I don't have uh, an exact number. There are numerous public officers, individuals, and board members that did file postal office, but I don't have a number. Uh, I'm sorry, that did file to yes. the president? Then I, I realize that this is uh, you know, something we couldn't, maybe can't determine now, but I would request through the president's administration that we could, in fact, determine just how widespread this was. You know, we are correcting it now, and I'm understanding that there's some number of board members who did manage to do so. I'm, I'm curious if that number is a tiny number or an extremely large number. That's really what I'm getting at. Um, so if that information could be provided in the near future, I'd very much appreciate it. Is that possible through the president? Through the president, yes, it's possible. And it will be done, I assume? Through the president, yes, it will Sorry, be done. Sorry, didn't want to get wordsmithed there. Okay, thank you. Legislator Cayley. Thank you, Mr. President, through you to the administration and, and to you. Um, I let, I, there may be more questions after mine, but I don't know. I, I find a brief statement. I find the whole thing, um, again, not to belabor the nothing burger, but I also find the use of that comment insulting coming as an official statement from the office of the county executive. and. Uh, that I just don't understand. I find that embarrassing as a whole on this body. I am remiss because I did not contact you on the job that you were doing. So through you, Mr. President, um, I should have. However, uh, when um, Legislator uh, Morelli asked why did you not reach out to leadership, I do believe that it's your responsibility to reach out to at least the majority and the minority leader to explain what's happening, whether you know the whole story or not. So I do lay that at your feet, not mine. But I have since changed my mind as to what I'll do. I'll knock on your door the next day every time. Um, I do have a couple questions with regards to this one. Um, is, this, is this policy of um, oath of office, is this a written policy? Is it A, B, C, D, Roman numerals? Is it a whole package yet? Through the president, if you're asking about the, the process going forward, uh, it's been determined, is it written out in the package right now? No, but it will be immediately after this meeting. I'm not sure that I understand that, but through you to the administration, will the procedures be written down and housed somewhere within this county building? Are you, are you speaking, just to clarify, are you speaking of the procedures after we make an appointment or the county executive makes an appointment, what happens next? Or are you talking about state law that requires No, not that state law. It's the procedures that we would take to, to ensure that everyone uh, executes their oath of office within 30 days. I believe the county executive has directed the law department uh, to manage the, the, the tracking of the oaths of office to ensure that they are happening. Uh, this body submits referrals to the county clerk as a normal course of business, uh, and we will, our clerk uh, is instructed to notify the law department whenever we make an appointment, and I assume that the administration will also pass along any appointments they make uh, to the law department. So uh, as far as a written policy, Excuse me, Mr. President, I don't understand why you wouldn't. Because you are not going to be here forever. She is not going to be here forever. And I'm not saying this in disrespect. But the reason that we are where we are is because someone along the line did a sloppy Joe job. And we forgot what we were supposed to be doing. So it's worse than a nothing burger. You drop the ball. 
but it started to be dropped before this administration. So I'll lay it on people before us as well. But my point is, if you don't write it down, someone's going to forget. And we're here again, and I, I won't be here to be embarrassed, but somebody else will be here to be embarrassed. It was a very sloppy job, and I believe that it needs to be recorded. And I would like to get a copy of that procedure when it's done. If I may, through you to the administration, I would request that we have a written statement on this and it be accepted and it be shared. A question I have is with regards through the president to the administration with the board of MCC and how you're dealing with the policy on that one or the procedures. MCC's board has um, a four, four members that are appointed by the state, two members that are appointed, appointed by the students and I forgot the number, excuse me, that are appointed by, this, by the county or, or recommended by the school itself. I do know by asking Carla Palumbo, uh, who was the last appointed, um, I believe, trustee over there, uh, that her oath of office was completed and it is housed within the government of New York State. But that confuses me as well. So the question is, what's the procedure with Monroe Community College? Have the students completed an oath of office? Are they required to complete an oath of office? Is MCC responsible for maintaining those records or, as well? Or is Monroe County's law department responsible for that? And that's one that speaks to the need to have it written down because someone's going to forget. And that actually is a question even though I went on to make a statement with it. So through you respectfully, how are you dealing in that situation? Through the president, what we are doing is creating uh, a list of all of the public officer positions. And as far as MCC is concerned, there are five trustees that are appointed by this body. Mm -hmm. And they will be tracked through the law department to assure that when they're appointed, they'll be notified to file an, off, an oath of office in the clerk's office, and we will follow up to see that it's done. Thank you. But to that point, MCC is a direct result of government uh, oversight of this body. And if the entire board does not take its oath of office, then MCC is not operating in correct fashion. So I would think um, that we would have a bit of oversight over not just the five people that MCC, that, that are appointed by the county. Through the president, uh, you had mentioned a student representative. The student representative is specifically not a public officer. Uh, okay. As far as the state appointees, that's the responsibility of the state to appoint them and, and see that they file an oath of office. Thank you. I understand that. Um, my, my consideration is that it's a body together. It may be appointed by different areas. It may take its oath from different areas. But as a whole, it works together. And I see no reason against writing down the policy or the procedures that don't let anything slip by. We're expecting New York State is not going to make a mistake. I hear over and over again in this chamber that New York State has made mistakes. So I'm thinking that we are, we are short-sighted where that board is concerned. Um, going on, it, we've talked uh, through you, Mr. President, to the administration. Is the quest to find any other public officers still ongoing, or do you feel that you've exhausted the list? Through the president, we have uh, finished our review. Thank you. And then uh, when it's finalized, uh, may we sh be share, w will you please share that list of public officers that need to take the oath of office through the president to the administration? Through the president, yes, we intend to. Uh, produce that list for the uh, legislature's office. Thank you. Um, I did have one question uh, with regards to the audit committee through the president to the administration. Uh, I've recently been seated on the audit committee. Is that a committee that is um, has been looked at as to whether or not the people serving on that committee, since they are public and private, should take an oath of office? Uh, 
All the committees have been reviewed, and those are not positions that are public offices, yes, the Audit Committee. Okay. And then, through you, finally, who determines of the people that are um, appointed through this body, because we do the appointing and the, the approval through the president to the administration, who decides what's a public office and what's not? Is that done through state law, or is that done through the law department? State law refers that to, to me. But there are positions that are by law public offices as well, for, and elected officials, for example, are automatically public offices. So there, there's not one answer to that question, but if there's not a statutory answer, then it's up to me. Thank you. And then through the president, then I would revert back to the audit committee is not being deemed um, necessary of taking public office, since they are responsible for examining the audits of Monroe County's ongoing departments, why you would deem them, question, why through the president you would not deem that um, equal to a public office, oath of office, excuse me. Because they don't meet the legal requirements of what a public officer is. Thank you, then through the president, could you explain that? Through the president, maybe the best way to explain it is to uh, cite some, some case law. I'm sorry I don't have the actual name of the case here, but the language is it's often difficult to determine whether a particular position is a public office as opposed to public employment. As the court put it, the line between a public officer and public employment has not been too clearly marked by judicial expression, probably because the distinction is not too clear. So my point is it's a fine line, but Ultimately, it's whether the individual serving in the position uh, acts with the sovereign functions of the government for the benefit of the public directly. All right, thank you. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. Thank you. Legislator Lightfoot. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to just um, explain my vote. There was some. Uh, uh, valid points brought um, to light today, and um, you know I've been working for the county a very long time, and um, I know how sometimes these things happen. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, people in, in high authoritative positions, um, we rely on them, but in reality, we're just some regular old folks trying to do the best we can. Mr. President, um, what I want to do is um, offer you something, um, Mr. President, or um, because uh, if we do it on this side, it just won't, it, it, it'll, it'll be a, probably a nothing burger or something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. So for all the um, time I, I've served on the um, Charter Committee, which was an honor and privilege, um, you know, this is a great time to amend it with um, this policy that you have or that is coming forth. And so that will be a, my gift for you to write it up, Mr. President. Uh, you're on your way out soon. And uh, you need something to hang your hat on. And this would be a great one uh, of how you saved the county. Can I wear a cape, <laughs> legislator? Okay. Like All right. So um, with that being said, I'll take my seat now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Legislator. Legislator Mulio. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't mean to end on a negative note, but I think this is something I've brought up before, so I wanted to just restate this. You did state before, Mr. President, that uh, all of these individuals are being reappointed, and so they have been approved by this body before. However, this body is ever-changing. Not all of these individuals have come before my eyes before and there was no qualification CV or resume presented for each of these individuals, which I imagine your office is holding. Uh, in the future, I hope that you can pr provide those to us, even if it is at 445 the day before, because I do uh, like to read. So uh, I would appreciate that in the future.
so that I may uh, review the qualifications of these individuals before I actually take a public vote on that. Uh, accordingly, to explain my vote, uh, I will be voting no in this matter because I have not had the opportunity to review the qualifications of these individuals. I do sit as the liaison of the Water Authority, and I find those people to be um, perfectly well suited to, to work in that capacity. However, all the other things that we're voting on, I have no personal knowledge uh, regarding their qualifications, and thus I'll be voting no. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, roll call vote, please. Mr. Marionetti? Yeah. Ms. Cayley? Yeah. Mr. Alcoffer? Yeah. Mr. Ancello? Yeah. Mr. Baroth? Yeah. Ms. Boyce? Yeah. Mr. Brew? Yeah. Mrs. Brown? Yeah. Dr. Carbone? Mrs. Conley? Yes. Mr. Delahanty? Yes. Mrs. DeFlorio? Yes. Mrs. Draw? Yes. Mr. Felder? Mr. Flagler Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hebert? Yes. Mr. Howland? Yes. Mr. Lightfoot? Yes. Mr. Michike? Mr. Morelli? Yes. Mr. Moyo? Yes. Mr. Rocco? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Ms. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Turp? Yes. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Zale? Yes. President Danielli? Yes. 27 to 1, resolution passes. Thank you. Next item, Madam Clerk. Item number 19, referral 17-0174. Moved by Legislator Marionetti, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. Legislator Cayley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I did have um, a question or two um, about this, but I first want to say that I agree wholeheartedly with the PLA, uh, and I know that had I heard of this before, I would have zeroed in on it. So my question to the administration is after reading the referral and learning that a great deal of um, organization had been spent in creating this, why as a member of the Monroe County Airport Authority am I just hearing about it or was I missing at a meeting? Duh. Through the chair, this agreement is with the county and the county is entering into the PLA, not the authority. Understood. Thank you for that answer. However, I would have expected to hear this in discussion at the airport board it, meetings, even in passing. Through, Thank you. Th through the president, it was in between meetings. This has happened rather quickly, um, and you will be getting a briefing on it in the upcoming meeting on the whole status of the project, not just the PLA. Thank you, and then why I appreciate this happening. I would have also appreciated hearing about it beforehand in an in, in MOU under the circumstances that we are here at this length of time tonight. I realize that most people won't agree with me, but that is my opinion. Uh, this is something that if it were going on and being talked about, it could have certainly been talked about in um, a board meeting a while ago with the airport. But. Through the chair, it wasn't it. It wasn't on the table at the last authority meeting. All right. This thank has you. come through this, through them. Any further discussion? There being none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Item carries. Next item. Item number twenty, referral seventeen dash zero one seven five. Moved by Legislator Marionetti, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. Any discussion? Legislator Muyo. Thank you, Mr. President. I won't waste too much time, but uh, again, to explain my vote uh, based on uh, my lack of knowledge concerning these individuals, I'll be voting no in this matter. Thank you. Any further discussion? There being none, roll call vote, please. Mr. Marionetti? Yes. Ms. Cayley? Yes. Mr. Alcoffer? Yes. Mr. Ancello? Yes. Mr. Baroth? Yes. Ms. Boyce? 
Mr. Brew? Yes. Mrs. Brown? Yes. Dr. Carbone? Yes. Mrs. Conley? Yes. Mr. Delahanty? Yes. Mrs. DeFlorio? Yes. Mrs. Draw? Yes. Mr. Felder? Mr. Flagler Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hebert? Yes. Mr. Howland? Yes. Mr. Lightfoot? Yes. Mr. Michike? Yes. Mr. Morelli? Yes. Mr. Moyo? Yes. Mr. Rocco? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Ms. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Turp? Yes. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Zale? President Danielli. Yes. 27 to 1, resolution passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item, please. Item number 21, referral 17 0176. Moved by Legislator Marionetti, second by Legislator Delahanty. Legislator Bra. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I'd just like to say thank God it's summertime. It's still light out. We'll get home and can still see things. That's good. Um, I have uh, two quick questions. One is the traditional one that I didn't ask earlier because it was, it was just obvious. Um, but why is this uh, being introduced as a matter of urgency, Mr. President? Uh, through the President, <clears throat> Bob Burns from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, this relates to the county's efforts to uh, complete a very comprehensive uh, interoperable radio system for first responders and our commitment to firefighters, police officers, and uh, EMTs to have a very high coverage uh, um, rate, a 95% coverage uh, throughout the county. Uh, a few years ago, we uh, secured a grant so that the, uh, the costs of adding to our 18 existing towers or repeater stations uh, would be offset by this grant. It took a very long period of time to identify the locations in our county that would provide that 95% uh, in-building coverage. And by the time that consultant's uh, report was finally adopted by um, the county, we found ourselves in a situation where the grant that we had received could be in jeopardy even with a couple of months delay. Uh, we also found that a, a plot of land uh, that is the most perfect location for one of the towers, uh, we could lose the opportunity to purchase that land with even a, a short period of uh, delay. So that, that uh, through the President, is the primary reason for the matter of urgency. Thank you. That was a very clear explanation. I appreciate that. And then finally, my, my second question is, it states that the re uh, request for proposal was issued. Uh, and my question is, how many respondents do we have for that request for proposals? Uh, through the President, we had four respondents. Four respondents, thank you. And of those four respondents, um, were they all considered to be um, um, qualified through the president? Not necessarily most qualified, but qualified. Uh, through the president, uh, I believe yes, but uh, as you know, the selection committee uh, identified the, the absolutely most qualified based on experience uh, building these towers or doing the environmental work for these towers, having a local office, um, and so on. So all, I believe they're all qualified, but CHA was uh, identified as most qualified. Okay, thank you very much. Any further discussion? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. There being no unfinished business, Legislator Marionetti. Thank you, Mr. President. We stand adjourned until 6 p.m. Tuesday, July 11th, 2017.